G'day Legends, Shoe Geeks, episode for August here. Um, a bit of a different one this week because there's no moose on this one. It's just Tom and Nitter. And there are, it's a presentation they both did covering running shoe prescriptions in relation to running injuries over the years. Um, they did this for the Podiatry Association. So a very evidence-based podcast. I hope you enjoy it. The boys did warn me that it's pretty um, pretty nerdy and it may bore a few people, they reckon. That's not the best sell of a podcast, but I'm sure it's fantastic. Um, no vid- video footage for this one. So for the people that watch it on YouTube, that is not an option this month. It will be next month, though. So just audio here. Enjoy the episode. I'm sure there's some great stuff in it. And a massive thanks to Tom and Nitta for putting it together. So I'm joined here by Tom DeCanto. Uh, as you guys mentioned, he's a private practicing podiatrist. Um, he's a father of two, um, Poppy and Leo, and he is also a marathon runner. Now, he's not just a marathon runner, Tom. Tom is ranked 45th of all time in a marathon. So how you going, Tom? You going well? Thanks for the intro, Mike. Um, yeah. Actually, we shouldn't really call you a marathoner because you're ranked 17th in the half marathon. It's a better performance than your marathon. It's true. I, I reckon I've got more to give in the marathon. I've got to, got to even out that that ranking for Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. Okay, so the whole idea of this concept, we're going to run a uh, podcast format and uh, Tom and I are both relatively busy people and we, we do do a podcast once a month about shoes and what we talk about. So we thought we might be able to discuss today something that's relevant for the podiatrist listening and we're going to discuss... Um, running injury paradigms and the relationship with running shoe prescription, where it's sort of come from and where it's currently at. So I'm going to start by just asking Tom a couple few questions as well. Tom's been running for over two decades now. Is that about right? Yeah. Yeah. We we essentially met for the first time, uh, not directly met uh, at a race. You you would have been 16, you would have been 15 in Tanunda, Barossa Valley, 5.5k event. And uh, I reckon oh, what, I won the state cross country that year. So I was uh, relatively arrogant. Don't know why you were doing in, in Barossa Valley that year. And I thought we took off and you took off. And I thought, oh, he'll come back to us. He can't be that good. He'll blow up. Anyway, you won by a minute over 5Ks. I think it was thereabouts. Can you remember what shoes you were wearing that day? It's funny you remember that well. Um, mm. I was wearing, I think I was wearing a pair of um, Adidas, Adistar something. Really low. Sure. It was that really light? Was, yeah, just a traditional racing flat, mm. lightweight, not that yeah. cushioned. It was yeah, yeah. Okay. So you've you've been a podiatrist now for about fifteen years, I think thereabouts. Is that right? Uh, Eleven years. Eleven years, and uh, you also lived in London for a period of time. And you worked in retail in the Nike shop in uh, on Oxford Street. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So the Nike Town store on in Oxford Circus. Yeah. Yep. And you're also a runner, and you're very experienced in that. What ratio of the experiences of all three of those things, working in retail, running, and being a podiatrist, has influenced your knowledge today in the area of footwear and running, you reckon? Yeah, it's a good question, isn't it? Um, it's obviously, it's a mesh of, of things. I would say my real world experience as a runner is kind of unique and, and helpful just because, you know, you and I are both, um, trying on and using a lot of shoes and because we're both now and yourself you're running longer you've come from a more mm-hmm. of a sprinting background but now we've drawn you into the the long stuff which is good um, but yeah I think just even, even if it's not high mileage I think anyone I think anyone listening to this if you want to know more about running shoes, I think running in running shoes just doing some running getting some you know, collecting some personal experience is uh, hugely beneficial um, so I'd say, yeah, and, and because of the duration I've been running, so now 20 years, um, I've got, I've collected this sort of history of, um, uh, yeah, experience with, with footwear in that respect. And then 
I guess <clears throat> the retail side of things was very interesting. So all through um, my my sports science and then through podiatry, I was working part time in in retail as well as that one year I had in Nike Town, um, and yeah interesting so we, we'll get onto the paradigms but mm. we've i know we've chatted before so basically i i was working in retail at a time where it was heavily focused around a, an objective rear foot alignment sort of um, paradigm so i was recommending mm -hmm. footwear um pretty largely based on how much someone's uh how much their shoe was everting as opposed to i mean mm. you, we know that we can't necessarily see what exactly the the, the, the calcaneus is doing inside the shoe, but you can see how much that that shoe tilts inwards. And so I was, you know, that was a, a selling point at, at both the, where I was working in Sydney at Running Science and also um, Nike Town actually had in London, had had treadmill set up and had cameras set up and mm. we did the same thing in Nike Town as well. Um, That's interesting. So look, if you go back to the early days when you're running as a teenager and late teens as well, look, how much, how much of like, I mean, we, People listening to this will be um, considering how to select a shoe for their patients in relation to, you know, reducing injury risk. And that's probably the guts of it when we deal with allied health. But how much did you personally, when you selected the shoe, think about sustainability and running and injury risk at that time, even compared to now as a clinician? Yeah, it, yeah. Yeah, probably not a great deal. Like I started running when I was 15. Probably at that point, it was more about how the shoe looked, to be honest. I just mm. wanted something that would that, that other other kids were running in, maybe. I think I remember yeah. I'd, I'd seen some other shoes that other kids had and I wanted the same shoe. Um, yeah. That was the, the crux of it. And then, uh, yeah, I think my first pair of runners, um, my first pair of daily trainers were the Asics Kayano. Um, yeah. And that was a classic sort of, I went to the store with my mum and the salesperson said, oh, he wants, you know, he's taking his running seriously. This is the shoe. He's got slightly low arches. Um, Kayano, I might have brought out another pair. I don't know. But um, yeah, it was it was the Asics Kayano that I went with back when I was probably 15. So I would have started a little bit early. I was more like about 13, but I was doing, like you said, a bit of just general track and field jumps and shorter sprints. And my first shoe that I ever wore was, um, I grew up in the country, so Asics was sort of like the retail shops in the country were biased towards buying large stock of one company. And also so Asics, Asics was biased, football, netball, and running. So Tiger Touch was my first shoe. And I had, that, I had two pairs of Tiger Touch from like, you know, age 12, 13, and 14. And my first industry change or notice of it was I went to the GT 2050, I think it was. And the 2050 was um, a highly um, moderately weighted shoe, a highly posted shoe with a large duo max post. And it went from the, almost from the underneath the first MPJ all the way back to the central part of the rear foot. I've got no sample shoe like that, but I remember when it hit its end of life, because when you were younger, you just took the shoe to the end of its life. It was uh, like worn completely inverted because the um the, how dense the medial foam was and how how far it travelled through the shoe was quite excessive. Didn't consider that at the time, um, but look, that was a large industry change and the shoe was definitely not as enjoyable as the Tiger Touch for me even back those days. But I just didn't really think about it. So even the the the, the paradigms we discussed today. Like they may not influence the consumer too much either. Um, so when we got people working into retail, they're not always picking a shoe to to not get injured, if that makes sense. It's just one piece of the puzzle. But for what we're talking about today, we're talking about shoes that essentially have um, evolved to try and make a runner reduce time lost in running. And that's the yeah. key. So, and, and how do these kind of shoes have been marketed? So it's yeah, that's right. And that's that's interesting because I mean you know in the 1950s and 60s when you were a runner you were you were you know you normally if you were doing it as an activity you were doing it as a more than an activity it's probably a bit more than a hobby. But simple events like if you go back to the 1960s and 70s and then you, I think you probably would say it's biased to the American marketing strategies. We saw Frank Shorter win the marathon on TV in 1972. It became largely exposed. Even Steve Prefontaine and that era of probably the early 70s, that running sort of started to get more interest in the general public. And then we started to see, um, you know, marathons and fun runs get mass participation involvement. So suddenly footwear became an industry where you can make money as well. And um, we try and, and footwear companies in their right minds use that to, to uh, their advantage. But of course, they, they were still trying to help the consumer. And at that point in time, the one limitation with running like or unlike other endurance sports like say swimming and cycling 
musculoskeletal injury and limitation from impact load seems to be well it seems to be the actual limitation of how much running you can handle right so yeah so that probably starts us off with the first paradigm which was sort of noted as this um you know this uh pronation control paradigm which probably kicked off in the 1970s and arguably still used a little bit today but probably has faded a little bit more into insignificance in the past decade or so can you talk in to a bit about what what it was trying to achieve and uh, what features in, in shoes were added to try and achieve this yeah so um i guess i think it was probably late 70s where it was sort of there was a paper i think late 70s that came out um, and the authors highlighted a number of things, but pronation was was one of those as a as a risk factor leading to a number of those. And it was a, I think it was, they they attributed it to quite a significant percentage of runners mm -hmm. developing an injury associated with a, a flatter foot. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know where they got those numbers from, but uh, or how they attributed it to the pronation. But it seems that since then. Um, uh, the company started to i think brooks was the first one maybe late late 70s i think it was the chariot of memory the brooks chariot with the wedge yeah. inside the shoe yeah, yeah there was a wedge so yes yeah, so mm. it started with a i think it started with a wedge there was a medial or a virus wedge um and then i think asics in early 80s had the first duo max the first dual density midsole mm. um, so i guess it was trying to achieve um a reduced amount of rear foot eversion um or pronation which they thought at the time was associated with with injury. So um, the marketing was all around, um, yeah, reducing movement that they thought would contribute to to injury. Um, so in a retail setting or even a clinical setting as well, what what are the best methods do you think we've we've seen to or the current methods that are or the previous methods that were seen to assess you know whether someone should be using a, a wedge in a shoe for example like I know yeah. there's been pa papers looking at static motion and dynamic motion and um, which which ones are being used can we give an example yeah well they've used lots like there's like there's static arch heights so there's just like mm -hmm. like that massive Kapnik this is the Kapnik military study. Mm. Um, that was just, I think, off a pedograph, like a or a photo Footprint. of the plantar surface mm. of the foot, and so that yep. was a classic wet foot test style yep. um, prescription Absolutely. based shoes off like arch height, which we know doesn't really represent movement and and dynamic yep. function. So yep. that's already an issue. Um, so I reckon that was a big one. That like you know the, the run as well, you know, would promote the wet foot test to select whether you go neutral, stability, motion control. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and that they were the three main sort of categories, I guess. There was like the neutral category, stability, which has some mild stability features, and then the motion control, the big, you know, like Brooks yeah. style ones. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, I, I guess, yeah, it's, it's just so variable. There's there's um, the rate of pronation, there's the actual mm -hmm. amount of excursion, the total amount of, of, of rear foot pronation. Um, yep. Yeah, <laughs> what what are your what are your uh, thoughts on well, that? It's, it's, it's interesting. So I, I, when I worked in retail for the first time, it was probably just prior to online sales. I'd probably, I was probably maybe second year podiatry, 2005. Online sales were around, but people didn't really trust them. And back then, people who um, bought a posted shoe, for example, normally sort of came into retail and said, I've got a flatter foot, I want a GT2000, just a traditionally posted shoe. Um, if they were a, like a higher arch foot, whether it was self audited or whether it was practitioner audited, you never really knew in retail. They didn't really go into it. And you as a ret retailer never really assessed it back in then either. So people would just grab the shoe, knew their size. And back then retail was easy. You wouldn't even have to like sell the shoe to them. They'd just pick it up and walk out the store with it and pay $200 or back then $150 for it. So, um, but there's no doubt that public perception of, um, of foot, foot position or foot posture um people believe then there was a study in 2014 the Sagittaria study i think it was and they sort of people believe that injury risk was associated to uh, getting the right shoe for the right foot posture yeah so marketing worked in that sense you know after all those years of marketing and decades of marketing um people believe that um that position or uh, attributes of shoes can um, reduce risk of injury especially in that pronation paradigm the interesting thing is when you look at papers in the literature, I mean, one, um, some papers will publish that re that rear foot eversion and pronation isn't associated with injury. Some will, will associate it is, 
and these these non-causal associations are really tough to dissociate from other factors that cause running related the injury it's so multifactorial but we do know that these features that were put into shoes there's enough literature out there to suggest that these these features probably are doing what they were trying to be doing so you know you put a medial posting in or a varus wedge there's been papers showing that it does reduce you know rear foot eversion or the rate of rear foot eversion in some papers um the problem with this is that that may not be associated to injury. So yeah. you've got um, almost two sides of the coin through here. Yes, you may stop eversion, but if that's not truly what's causing your problem, uh, you might not be you know, resilient to injury. And I guess the Nielsen study from 2014, which was a one year pr prospective study, grabbed these novice runners, right? And you know this paper pretty well. I think it was close to, close to a thousand people in this study, followed them prospectively for the year, and categorized them into foot type but gave them all neutral running shoes and there was no difference in um, whether you uh, received a motion control shoe um, so no, no whether, whether you had a flat foot posture a high arch foot posture into a neutral shoe so for the novice athlete it doesn't really seem to make a difference whether your foot is flat your foot is high in fact this study showed the people that were um were quite pronated were sort of a bit more resilient to getting an overuse injury in a, in a neutral shoe so so it doesn't seem to be one of those features that's more important but i knew there was a paper you might be able to know this one it was a couple of years later where they took not novice runners but slightly more experienced recreational no, runners that's the one yeah, yeah do you remember so that paper yeah so um that was quite a large one as well i think maybe 800 runners prospectively um one uh yeah one group was was prescribed i think just the uh neutral and the other group was prescribed based on um foot posture i believe mm -hmm. and um yeah. yeah there was there wasn't a huge difference apart so when they looked at sub uh categories it was just the highly pronated group that had a protective effect if they were wearing the motion control shoe absolutely so, yeah it's yeah so there's conflicting studies um yeah. but there is some there from that study which is a relatively well designed study but yeah, it was a different cohort they were experienced runners um yeah. but yeah they the, the highly pronated group which wasn't actually a huge number of the runners mm. but they were they had less injuries if they were allocated the motion control shoe absolutely so that is the absolute confliction of um of literature in this area so yeah. It's what's interesting now is that I guess you and I discuss this on the Inside Running podcast often is that there are different ways to uh, maybe manage foot posture that aren't, you know, plastic or high density foams to try and stop motion, for example, accommodate it. I only have one shoe left in my whole collection of about 50 shoes, I reckon, that has a medial posting on it. And so I'll grab that. Where is it? It's the bongo. Yeah. yeah. So this is the New Balance bongo. I'm sure New Balance are chatting to everyone later on. The posting is quite minimal, I would say, compared to what it was historically. So it's slightly denser foam, strategically placed on the um, the, the medial aspect of the shoe. Sort of starts under just underneath the medial, or well, probably the where the, the first MPJ sort of lies a bit further forward and goes to about just the calcaneus. And look, this this shoe I find to be quite comfortable. I personally don't find it much different to wearing the 1080 though, um, which is a very similar geometry shoe with the without the posting on it either. My problem is I don't really hit that part of the shoe too much, so it's not as not as relevant for me. So, so is there a time and place for this paradigm still, Tom, to use it, and um, when and where may this be? So, I want to just, just touch on a couple of things. So, just going back to the the motion and and whether because there's there's conjecture around like can medial posts even mm. um, correct or or reduce pronation. Um, and so, yeah, there's conflicting studies, but I think most of the evidence lies similar to the orthoses research where orthoses and, and medial post shoes may not change motion, but it seems like they will affect the kinetics or the forces. So you may not be able to see a change, but there may be internal stress distribution that, that is different mm. in a different type of shoe, one that's posted versus not posted. Yeah. Um, that's how I would sort of think about that and approach that with footwear. It's maybe not always what you can see with what's mm. happening um and yeah and what i think about i mean there's not many medial posted shoes left is there it's um there's there's probably a couple but this is just it um people are i guess accommodating a uh, a, a, a mobile foot or a pest planter's foot or a pronating foot so to speak in different what via different attributes now and we probably yeah. should chat to those attributes because yeah. 
um, this paradigm probably still subtly exists, but the way to to achieve it is not the same way it was in the 1990s. So um, this will be a good example for you to show some of your shoe yeah. collection. Yeah, good one. This guy. So yeah. this, this shoe is called the Kayano Light. So um, we all know that, the Kayano. That's not, that's not released yet, that one, is it, the third? Oh, it's Kayano Light 3. So this yeah. is the third iteration. I think this is about to come out. Yep. Um, so medial side here, you can, you, you probably, what you can't see is a medial post. So yep. it's, it's all one density of foam. Um, however, what they do to try and achieve stability is via geometry of the midsole. Um, so as you can see, it's sort of, it's relatively um, filled in and full contact through, through the midsole and the medial side. There's no trussic system, there's no plastic bits. Um, they're getting the stability through just geometry of the foam. And then you probably can't see it well on this video. If I get the light on it, you can see um, there's a little bit of a, a wedge or a taper laterally. So basically it gets, as it comes up here to the medial side, there becomes mm. more and more foam on the medial side. And, and conversely, it's like less foam as we come laterally. So these, this lateral area are like sm smaller pods that probably can compress a little bit easier than that medial mm. side, just because they've taken some foam away and, and, and sort of divoted that lateral aspect through here. So yeah. on, that re on that rear foot, does the rear foot invert a little bit or is it pretty well the same lateral and medial? Um, so I've got the got a, a I've got the first lateral bevel. It's not much. I've got the I've got the first iteration here, and they've aesthetically made it look like there's a bit of a varus yeah. attribute to it. It's interesting yeah. whether it's whether it is or not, or whether it's just aesthetic. I'm not 100 percent sure. That's mostly aesthetic, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So that's uh, Kayano Light. I think has been a great model for um, for runners in general. That it, like a runner that has always run in Kayano, standard Kayano. Um, they may just keep going to it because that's one of those shoes that runners keep just using if it's worked for them, but um, they, they may be okay in a non-posted stability shoe. Um, yep. So a lot of the models, and, and we have to talk about like Brooks. Brooks is, you know, because Brooks is, has been known for their postings and their aggressive nature, but yeah, yeah. Um, they, they kudos to them. They're the ones that probably one of the first companies to, to strip back all their models um, and withdraw posting and just use what's called, we'll get onto this, I guess, mm. the, the, the future, the other paradigms, but mm. they've, they've taken on another paradigm um, uh, by taking the posts out and trying to do things a little bit more subtly. Yeah, which is good, and I like that. And while we're just at the end of this paradigm as well, do you remember the paper and Nike, after releasing their Vaporfly, which we'll cover later on, they sort of moved away from that. And I think it was 2018, there was this paper, which I, for the life of me, cannot find it. It was meant to be published. It was out of the British Columbia. And they sacrificed one of their posted shoes at the time called the Nike Stru Structure Triax at the time. I think it was still the Triax at that point in time. And they released their um, their Infinity, and this was the um, this is the original version of the Infinity. So um, this shoe had a geometry of a of a natural rocker, but once again a large surface area to it. And they they essentially created attributes of a shoe that were probably a bit lighter. And these other the rocker, the cushioning systems, and the large surface area was meant to be a substitute almost for the posting of the shoe. And they followed injury rates for I think it was twelve weeks off memory. And the Infinity had a lot more success in this cohort. Now, I didn't get to see the methodology of the paper or anything detailed, but it was released strategically before the Infinity was released on the market. And it definitely had an interest in terms of reducing injury. Consequently, the structure still exists on the market now, but it has no posting. It does the same things as you've mentioned. They've, they've, they've changed a bit of the geometry of the midsole to keep it stable as an option, but removing the posting. So... I wonder how much companies really had to, they cringe before they actually executed a non-posted shoe for a long period of time, whether they were going to be losing, you know, sales because of this public perception of of support that is believed that's needed to, to keep someone injury free. So, so we are seeing the market evolve because we know the injury, pronation injury paradigm seems to be a little bit questionable. So, yeah. So where, where I, did we go to from there? I'll just, I'll just finish on that by saying, um, I think it's a good thing that medial posts are less prevalent in footwear from a general mass market perspective, because like you first mentioned, when you said your experience with that, the GT25 or whatever you said it was called, I don't even remember that model. It's 2050. But, yeah, yeah, it was yeah, long. 2050. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I cringe when I walk down the street and I see runners or walkers like with that 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 supinated um, virus effect looking very laterally unstable. And, uh, you know, it's just... Um, 
so we'll have probably have less runners and and walkers probably walking in running shoes that that are wearing it wearing these shoes abnormally mm. um but on the the other side of that um if the market can can retain some uh meal posted shoes that's probably a, a bonus for podiatrists who who are still using it as a prescription shoe for like things that that may benefit from it like really yeah like mm -hmm. extremely pronated feet that have pathology like tib posts for example um yep. where i find clinically that medial post for for one of those patients with a tib post issue um can be hugely helpful absolutely so. and that, that's that time and place scenario isn't it so um intermittently you you whinge about having a sore tib post and you're off running in your your, your um your kano light for a while and solving the puzzle once again you know using a shoe attribute through here to try and reduce your time lost in running right so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so, so we're, oh, sorry, you go no nah, you're right so so now we're gonna we're gonna touch on the the next sort of paradigm it, it, it sort of came concurrently i guess with the pronation paradigm but that's um impact force uh moderation um, and so um, that's where uh, firstly cushioning came into things. So that's where um, running shoes, try, like brands tried to keep developing running shoes with better, more advanced cushioning systems, mm -hmm. which um, uh, purportedly would, would um, help reduce running ri uh, injury risk. Yep. Um, and then I guess the other thing we'll get onto from that more recently is the whole barefoot minimalist type trend that sort of happened a bit, bit more recently. So say 2000, what, 2005 to 2010 sort of started to see that trend. Um, and that is, that was also, even though it's less shoe, less cushioning, that was proposed to reduce impact and also help mm -hmm. reducing injury. So two kind of competing, uh, footwear, um, categories but trying to achieve the same thing so either, either absolutely have a lot of to try and reduce impact or or strip back to a more minimal shoe so people would run a little bit more like they were running barefoot so they would try and use their own body to absorb impact a little bit better rather than relying on the shoe is that a all right. that's good so the whole idea of this paradigm was to accommodate or reduce the the vertical impact um impact load which was i guess at the time suggested maybe is this guy the um the cause of all running related injury right so i mean you and i weren't around during the time when eva first was placed into a shoe but i'm sure that was a really exciting time and for runners at the time to go through there i looked it I up guess, it was 1975 yeah, there you go. Yeah. So that would have been a game, absolute game changer, wouldn't yeah. it? So uh, we, and we'll, we'll talk about the current performance models you know, going around now, but look, that would have been a game changer. But that had got a bit excessive, I suppose, when you start looking at now, obviously, I'll go back and say we're, we're discussing this aggressor paper, which was a systematic review looking at these impact of uh, these um, paradigms to choose or to prescribe running footwear. And they've got really good information on sort of the timeline of this. And you'd argue that the impact force paradigms existed all the way back the same time as the pronation paradigm, 1970. But that paradigm has evolved in the past decade or so, no doubt. And um, so a traditional shoe that had maybe 20 millimetres of stack height. And I guess the whole idea of a shoe construction, we need to understand that the upper doesn't seem to have much influence or ever been discussed about having an injury risk reduction uh, attribute, either as the outsole but the midsole is where the magic is, right? And so this is where the impact pulse or the impact load is meant to be either absorbed or modified in this area. So without making anyone feel like it's, you know, dumbing it down, but the midsole essentially is the foam inside the shoe. And most traditional running shoes, probably from 1980, when they started putting trussics in the shoes and, and building up more e using e EVA foams, were probably about 20 mils at the rear foot and about 15 to 10 in the forefoot. So there you go. That's it. And that's a traditional EVA foam, although the Neo is not. I'm not sure if it is. Oh, so you're muted, Tom. Sorry. Yeah, right, there right. you go. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, so, yeah, this is, I thought I'd bring out more of a traditional geometry midsole stack. So this is the Wave Rider Neo from Mizuno. And, um, yeah, I think they just use a, a traditional EVA in this. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so that's kind of like where the normal sort of levels of I guess average levels of cushioning came in and then I may as well just bring this one out so this is kind of where we've, we're headed <laughs> Tom keeps showing shoes that aren't released yet so uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> Look, I, I, I've got one here, mate. I've got the Bondi. Oh, you got it. Yeah, there you For go. One. Yep. Yeah. There you go. So, yeah, you, you keep going. Look, yeah, so what's happened, the whole idea is that all this foam, could it, uh, you know, absorb an imp impulse, decrease the ground reaction force and hypothetically reduce injury risk? Once again, conflicting research, um, you know, vertical impacts haven't always been associated to injury risk in some papers, but yet some papers have shown that maybe too much vertical impact may be associated to some types of injuries. The problem is, is that all this foam, for example, in 2014, there was a nice study looking at the high stack shoes from Kumata et al. And they found that when people were wearing the high stack shoes, the, Im the vertical impact load was um, globally higher um, when you put more, more shoe under your foot. And it sort of, to me, makes a bit of sense. You know, when you run with a lot of stuff beneath your foot, you can probably enter into the ground with probably a little bit more um, load, but perceptually not really realize you're doing it as much. Um, whereas I find it very difficult to run and hit the ground hard with no, minimal shoe on or no shoe on. Um, um, but once again, um, like people interact differently with the foams and interact differently when they are barefoot as well. So unfortunately, the way people are reacting with the foam can sometimes be hugely variable to the way they move and sometimes their physical attributes, even things such as body weight might be uh, a factor here as well. So yeah, which is important to note because there's been literature from like even Joel Fuller's paper in 2017 showed that I mean, he compared uh, a cohort of runners. Um, he was looking at actually running economy as his major attribute, looking at um, using the Asics Piranha, which is a very traditional racing flap, comparing it to a, a basic neutral shoe, the Asics Cumulus, similar to what the Mizuno you showed there. And people that were a bit heavier or above 84 kilos in this group who were wearing no cushion shoes were, just, were higher risk of injury. Now, the number or the end value was quite low, but that sort of makes sense to me as well. So conversely, there was a paper in 2020 from Lindorfer et al. And they found people that sort of wore a lighter weight people or lighter mass people who were wearing a shoe that had a lot of weight to it or, you know, a uh, firmer shoe, was, harder density yeah. foam were more inclined to get injuries as well. And that makes sense. Maybe a, a smaller person can't compress a foam as much. Maybe a big person can really compress that piranha really quickly. And there's just, that highlights the impulse maybe a bit higher again. So it's, this becomes even more complicated almost than the, the pronation cr control paradigm, I reckon. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, um, it's one of those ones where I think if you dived into some of those studies, and I don't believe that all of them have it, but uh, the the subject specific data on how they responded is probably quite variable. So there's an average, but how people respond to a highly cushioned shoe would be uh, different. Um, so for example, um, like there are a lot of people that when they go to a more minimal type shoe, they will alter their biomechanics and they may have uh, land a little bit less on their heel more towards the forefoot to try and get the, the, the foot and ankle to sort of slowly absorb that impact a little bit um, uh, quicker. And that was part of that paradigm was was wearing a more minimal shoe. So people would be forced to alter their biomechanics and forced to have a, a like a softer landing. So they would mm -hmm. land more forefoot. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, if you do land forefoot, you you completely eliminate that first sort of um, uh, vertical, vertical impulse. Impact. Yeah, ex mm -hmm. exactly. That, that, that um, initial contact peak, you can sort of eliminate that. Um, but the problem is there's some some subjects and some studies, they didn't alter their gait and they kept heel striking <laughs> and they actually had higher vertical loading rates um, with the more minimal shoes. So, mm -hmm. you know, and that's why it's actually in so this aggressor paper is great. So I think any podiatrist listening should, it's open access, should have the aggressor one, but also a summary of this other paper. Um, I have this one from 2018, you're the BJSM editorial from Rich Willie and oh, yes. Chris Nepia. Nepia. So they, Nepia. Yeah, so they, at the end of that, they said, you know, caution with, um, like if you want to try and um, moderate impact, you can do that not just by recommending shoes, you, you may want to be talk, talking to the runner about a changing their gait and just giving some simple simple cues. It, it probably isn't a good idea to just say to a heel striker, just run on your forefoot. That's not probably good technique change advice, but mm. something simple like increasing cadence is probably a relatively safe um, mm. uh, bit of advice that, that podiatrists can provide to, uh, to try and get people to land at a little bit of a more gentle angle on the heel. Yep. 
for example? There's, you know, there's there's foot posture, there's um, there's entry into the ground, there's body mass, there's all these influences that really confound whether uh, the impact force paradigm will be successful with the shoe prescription with it as well. So, look, and we we probably briefly discussed that, you know, we're talking about the vertical impulse, but the horizontal impulse or the braking loads. Um, and I know that Chris Napier study as well was sort of associated with more patellofemoral pain or global injury risk as well. And maybe a bit more shoe means you can search for ground a bit more and overstride a touch more as well. So, yeah, changing someone's training characteristics and maybe biomechanical attributes might be a safer way of achieving that. So, so this paradigm still at the forefront. These shoes are fun. It's made the industry definitely more enjoyable. But there are other paradigms that are probably utilised a bit more so and discussed now more than ever, especially in, in allied health. That being the habitual motion pathway, which was suggested by Bino Nick in 2015, where essentially the whole idea was almost to have a shoe that essentially just guides you in the pathway that you choose to choose to move. So the opposite to the pronation, it's not not trying to block something, perhaps maybe trying to change the way that you move might actually be an injury risk in itself. So picking a shoe that has the least amount of stuff in it that allows you to do what you want to do movement wise to have the best outcome. It's very arbitrary. It's not well researched and probably blends into the final paradigm, which is the comfort filter. Um, because essentially, I think experienced runners, when they go into a retail shop, they have a pretty good intuition on how to solve the puzzle of the shoe attributes they need more than the novice runner does more than likely because they've had experience with it before and a history of injury or not injury, to be more honest. So can you talk a little bit about the comfort filter and maybe touch on a little bit of this motion pathway because there are shoe companies like you mentioned doing this already like Brooks. Um, yeah so I guess like it, it's a bit of a it's in vogue like just wear something yep. that's comfortable that's discussed a lot and um, it, it obviously makes sense like you obviously don't want to pick a shoe that's uncomfortable but just picking it from comfort alone doesn't necessarily mean it's going to reduce running injury risk because it's still just yep. a relatively new um, un, uh yeah, it's not like it's newer, but it's no better than previous Absolutely. paradigms. I would, I would think. Um, uh, yeah, and so yeah, like as you mentioned, and I mentioned earlier, Brooks is a, a company that's sort of taken this on board, and they've they've done like the guide rails instead of medial posting, so medial yep. and lateral. Yep. So as they they as their marketing states, as the foot mm -hmm. either supinates or pronates past a certain amount, the shoe becomes a little bit more stable in either direction, almost like bumpers on a in a bowling alley. That's Absolutely. the analogy they I think they've used. So um, keeping that foot within a certain range of motion is kind of the ideal without trying to be too aggressive with controlling. Absolutely. Look, we need to touch on this comfort filter paradigm because when we talk about arbitrary um, paradigms, this is complicated because um, it's subjective. Um, comfort is subjective. And look, I, I want to ask a personal personal one from you because how has comfort changed in your running career and how has the industry even changed your perception of comfort and this probably brings us to some of the performance shoes now as well so what, what's it look like for you now compared to what it used to um i guess um yeah it, it, it evolves like it it's it's it evolves um gradually i would say over the years but it also changes in in a micro cycle like within a week i would say of, of training <laughs> um so when i first started running i was probably in much firmer shoes um i would say compared to what i run in now and now i would i would i really would not like to go back to running in the shoes i used to run in um i have got like i know you as well do have like some old shoes um that you've tried on here and there and i don't know whether it's just because they they're so old and, and they the midsoles deteriorated um yep or whether they they always felt that harsh but um i do think that i i've my perception has moved more to like more cushioning is more comfortable mm -hmm. um but i go through phases where i want like i'm at the moment in a phase where i've actually gone i've dialed back from running a lot in the real high stacks to more like moderate stacks like i'm doing yep. a lot of mileage in that mizuno that traditional kind of stack shoe yeah and i'm finding that more comfortable at the moment yeah. Um, yeah. So it, I think comfort is is obviously very personal, and yep. it can change um, like along a lifespan, but also within a more acute sort of scenario. Like if you've got like so, like sore calves post 
post uh, uh, interval session. Um, yep. Wear a shoe which is um, probably a little bit more, bit more shoe um, and a, a high drop to sort of take some load off the calves if they're feeling a bit sore. Absolutely. Yeah. Look, I, in the track season last year, we do a lot of work on the rubber. And so if I wore a traditional running shoe in that phase of running, the day after a hard track workout where there'd be a bit more tissue trauma, especially lower legs, I'd wear a bit more shoe. But I sort of I sort of adjusted quite nicely and I was wearing more traditional running shoes for day-to-day -day jogs. I was wearing a lot more of, you know, um, even the Reebok float ride for a period of time. Um, I was wearing even Nimbus Light at the time as well, a lot more. The winds has come along and I'm well, we've moved to the hills and I'm running on trails all the time and I'm not doing much fast work. And look, shoes like this, I'll give an example. Yeah. This is the this is the new balance. This is from this morning. This is the new balance um super comp trainer. This is 46 mils of foam at the rear of 47, I think, with an eight mil drop with a huge rocker and a carbon plate. This thing has saved my life but ruined my life. So it I, I really have of comfort is is now altered, I think, from wearing that shoe. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Everything look, else feels it, hard now. And I want to come down the continuum, you know, it's like, you know, coming off, I don't know, it's like a methadone clinic. You need to come down off the foam a little bit um, and to try and get out of it. But I really do battle with the perception of having slightly sore calves in these traditional shoes. So uh, there's no doubt that the industry is going that way anyway. Um, you know, we talk about, you know, cyclists used to ride alloy bikes and then carbon bikes became the norm. When they first came out, they were called super bikes. And now here we are with the performance running shoes now. With, with mass being the number one attribute associated to changing running economy for sub-maximal running, weight of the running shoe was why traditional racing flats were always lightweight with not much midsole. So you've got one there behind you and I've got one here, the Lunar Racer, but yours is probably a better example. You won Melbourne Marathon in that shoe, didn't you? Yeah, so this, yeah. this is called the, the Mayfly. It's just a thin stack of EVA um, and a really thin really thin upper so it, it weighs i think it's like 140 grams yep um so my first marathon was in this shoe um and it wasn't comfortable like it was comfortable up to half marathon then my feet the marathon my feet were sore and my second marathon was in in this shoe uh one year later and um the the comfort factor like this is one thing which is probably like i just don't see this as a as a, uh, a fad i i think <laughs> higher stack racing shoes are probably here to stay just from a, a comfort factor because now with the new foams and this is a question that someone wrote in about you know a bit about what's happening with with foams in running shoes but there's, a, there's an evolution particularly in the last decade of uh, advances um, beyond EVA and so this in 2017 this shoe came out this is the Nike Vaporfly at four percent and um this is using a uh, piba uh, or, or pbax which is nike's proprietary uh name for it but or zoom x but um mm. it, this foam is is extremely lightweight so they can get this high stack high amount of cushioning so it just feels mm -hmm. it feels so forgiving and comfortable and soft um but it's still, Look, and, and it's still light that shoe tom now feels like nothing to me because here <laughs> we are now this is the current state and I mean, this is not the new version, but it's it's close to. But I have to I have to feel like that I can't run in anything less than this. This is the Vaporfly, which you currently race in, where you ran your 62 yeah. low half marathon. It doesn't feel like enough for me anymore. I have to wear this shoe that's an extra four mils of foam beneath my forefoot. Yeah. And generally, we're seeing all the shoe companies. This is the Asics Meta Speed Sky achieving the same thing with you know slightly different attributes. This one has a higher carbon plate with a good surface area. Adidas have done the same thing with a really good surface area, but unfortunately a big varus bias to the shoe as well, which will work for some runners and not others. But it's sort of the reason why um, I cringe at the word super shoe, because this 10 years from now, this will just be a racing flat. It'll be the norm. And everyone in this generation won't remember the Mayfly, Tom. They won't know what you went through to go through that marathon because mm -hmm. that won't be a shoe that you'll be able to purchase anymore. So our comfort's really highly influenced by what the market offers us as well which means that comfort is this moving paradigm depending on what the industry offers us or, you know, can research, you know, influence the market? And the answer is, well, I think the consumer and the sales will, do, will really determine what the market does, right? And these shoes, they aren't just for the elite runner anymore. We know that the data is pretty clear. There aren't many non-responders to these types of shoes. And uh, the original study with Hoop Camera showed no non-responders to the Nike Vaporfly 
And now they're all trying to solve the puzzle of where the running economy comes from, right? So we know weight is an attribute, but that vapor fly through there is probably a bit heavier than your mayfly. Not massively heavier, maybe double the weight, you reckon, or 40% yeah, more weight? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's a sweet spot of being able to uh, change the way you move and your mechanics or perhaps maybe the return of energy from the foam, but it's embedded with this curved plate. So Tom, out of all those things, what works? What makes it more economical? You know, you know what I think about this? So yeah, so it's, I really think it's that, it's that foam. Um, it's, it's obviously a sum of all, all its parts, but, but I think you can't, you, you you can't do these shoes without the foam. Like if you don't have the foam, you don't have the super shoe because if you try and do the same geometry with a carbon plate with EVA, it's too heavy. So you reduce Absolutely. your, it, not only that, but the weight, but it's not, it's not um, resilient enough. So EVA foam, it returns maybe 65% energy. Uh, yep. TPU, which was used in like Adidas Boost, that's like about 75. And yep. this new foam is about 85, 80, 88% energy return. So it's getting close to Look, giving back exactly. almost what you exactly put Exactly right. And we've seen other brands try and use TPU to make the, the durability a bit better in their super shoes, like Sukoni did the Endorphin Pro, but the third version, I believe, is predominantly Piva, or they've got one coming out called the Endorphin Elite, which is, I think, 100% Piva, because the performance is in that resilient foam with energy return. And I think there was a nice paper from Hoodcomer and Healy, where they basically grabbed this, um, this is the Crimson version of Vaporfly 1, and they, they said, well, you know, is it the plate? And they put six cuts through the plate of the shoe, and they measured the running economy of the participants with the shoe that was cut and not cut. So the stiffness or longitudinal stiffness from the carbon plate and the economy, there was no difference. So, you know, so this, I guess this hypothetical teeter-totter effect, which essentially is the curved plate where you put mass down on the heel and then the, uh, the curved plate creates a bit of a fulcrum to create a nice lever, isn't truly responsible as much for the, um, the, the, the reduced running economy um or the increased running economy will re reduce oxygen for, for running but this affects everyone tom this is not just elite runners it's the icing on the cake for you you're economical because you run 100 miles a week but this is you can place this shoe on now and it's the quickest way from day one day to the next day to be able to gain two to three percent performance benefit from your running economy change even for the recreational runner so should they be wearing them should he be wearing them Re recreational runners who i don't know Re recreational runners should should that uh, is it useful for them um yeah i mean <laughs> depends <laughs> this is the question i'm depends. actually this is one of the participants should, asked. should we get this, into the debate of whether juniors should be wearing these oh i don't want to look wait, wait yeah it's it's tricky like the, the biggest way to get better running economy is years of running that's the best literature is right and then there's attributes like strength training but you know they're the things that make you who you are. But look, it, 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 running economy change and performance change is relative to the individual. But dare I say that, you know, I've got this one example. And I've used this before in the podcast. I've moved to the hills. There's a guy who's probably about 120 kilos running in the hills across the road. And I saw him in January and I saw him probably only about three or four weeks ago. And the guy has lost about maybe 20 kilos in weight. And he's got this sort of hydration vest on. And he's running in the vapor fly in the hills. Every time I see him, he's wearing the vapor fly, the, four, uh, the, the next percent. And I had to stop him and ask one day. I said, how do you find the shoes? And he said, well, if it wasn't for these shoes, I wouldn't be out here running. He said, they're so enjoyable. And look, here's a guy who's changing his metabolic health and getting healthier by wearing a shoe that he enjoys. So this paradigm of enjoyment and getting people to be able to run and find running a little bit easier is just a nice bridging of, of the of the gap for people. It may not be quite the same as the e-bike, but it's on its way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I reckon yeah. touching back on like wrapping up this whole comfort filter thing. Um, so obviously these more cushioning um, probably leads to a sensation of comfort for a lot of people. Um, but I guess we've got to look at comfort as well as like when they, if, if more studies are coming out or researchers looking into this, it's like, is it over what span of time? Like, obviously it's very different just trying on a shoe mm -hmm. um, and running up and down the street or on a treadmill versus like mm -hmm. using it for the first 50 K. Absolutely. Cause I reckon it's, it's not, it's probably maybe not till the first couple of runs where you realize that comfort might turn into 20 minutes into a run um, instability yeah. and, and something else. So that, that, yeah. So, for example, or the foam, example or with foam the foam too soft, and then you bottom it out within 20 soft. minutes. Yeah. yeah. So your example with that vapor fly is that that's a racing shoe. So I would say most people doing all their running in that shoe is quite risky for the fact that 
it's so um it's an extreme sort of type of shoe so most people should be in probably more of a like somewhere in the middle of like the extremes from minimal to maximal probably or even if it's maximal more of a training orientated model than a racing model which is very sort of slim line which um you can see how narrow how narrow sort of base and cut away through yeah, yeah. the mid foot it is so what will happen is um anyone that sort of deviated slightly um from sort of the like the, the normal bell curve distribution of, by, of mechanics say the amount of rear foot eversion probably that middle that once you start getting one or two standard standard deviations away from the mean they're going to be i'd say really not finding this that comfortable after after a few easy jogs because yeah. they're going to be crushing it either laterally or medially because it's a high stack for uh, high stack uh midsole which is super soft um and narrow and, and and probably not as durable as well like there's an economical aspect to selling a shield as well you don't want to be paying 320 dollars shoes for a shoe that you well, actually, I don't wear my shoes past 400 Ks much more often these days, but the foams are softer now. They don't really last much longer. So um, yeah. so that's the big difference. EVA foams, you probably got more dose out of them, didn't you? And we hear these traditional 600, 800 Ks in the shoe. Well, TPU is very, um, it's quite a compliant foam, a bit heavier, gives you a bit more life. PBAX probably doesn't quite have the same life to it. But look, if you divide the kilometers by how much enjoyment you had in them as well, you, I guess the value of the shoe changes a bit. But yeah. I still find, like, I mean, I know Julian likes to hold up. He thinks he holds up our podcast and he's probably a bit right. But he did mention that comfort seems to be this sort of daily changing attribute relative to the purpose that you're using it for. And look, for a long, long run, sometimes you want the foam to be more resilient and you want it to be able to sustain and be as enjoyable at the end of the run as you do at the start. And sometimes for a really, really short run after a hard day before, you want it to be a really, really soft foam to just basically attenuate loads. So you can handle more time running and decrease time loss. And that's probably one thing in the high impact model. I believe it was the Agresta study in 2018 found that people that were wearing high stack shoes more often or not, that seemed, even when they were injured, they just seemed to have lost more time. Uh, they'd lost less time to, to running. They could get back to running a little bit earlier. So pain and soreness. And this is the whole idea, the combination of these paradigms more than likely We've got attributes in shoes that basically is trying to offload a particular anatomical tissue, whether it be a heel pitch to offload a posterior calf, whether it be a rocker sole, a stiff rocker sole to offload four foot base pathology, or whether it be big surface area or medial posting to offload the medial part of the ankle joint or subtalar joint, just to keep a person moving forward and running. Because at the end of the day, there is musculoskeletal risk in a shoe if it changes the way that you move potentially. But it's not as risky as being inactive and you know getting a cardiovascular based condition because you you avoid running because you think the shoe is the reason why you can't do it yeah so um should we should we wrap up with are there any questions that, were in that you want to answer look there's a there's a question here about the specific brand suit uh specific foot types and they talk more about width of shoe and look i think we want to touch on this there are, i don't actually have an ultra shoe or a topo athletic but mm. there are some shoes out there that are designed specifically that they're anatomically fitted so plenty of podcasts with the um the the owners of ultra and this whole idea of trying to basically build a, a shoe that accommodates the anatomical fit of a shoe um, whereas most shoes are a bit pointier and narrow in the toe box some shoes do are specifically designed for comfort to reduce risk of bunion pain perhaps or uh, you know pressure on the fifth or fourth digit etc there's not heaps of shoes specifically doing that i think a lot of shoe companies have multiple widths with help as well like new balance is always famous for being a bit boxier in the shoe and a bit squarer and you know you get into a 4e there or 6e in some of the trainers or cross trainers they can really you know accommodate a really wide foot but i think that's pretty common knowledge now i don't think we need to dive into that too deeply no, no. um We've done midsole materials, I think, enough. Um, we've discussed weight. That was a question. So yep. I think we've... The Agresta study mentioned uh, in its summary that that you want to look for a lightweight shoe as a general mm -hmm. recommendation. I don't necessarily agree with that. That's a, that, that would be, like I guess, a performance consideration. But if, yeah. if you want to just get more running in as you say to get that yep. performance benefit just from consistency in running yep. uh, i think weight should be secondary to comfort or maybe some of the other yeah paradigms. absolutely 
Look, I think I think the aggressor study walked away with these attributes because they couldn't really solve the puzzle with shoes that reduce injury risk, right? But we do know the science of lightweight running shoes increases performance. And like I said at the start, people aren't selecting shoes always for, um, you know, for injury risk reduction. Sometimes they're trying to run a bit faster. I think I think the only other point you said is that when you're trying to get fit and run faster, we don't need lightweight carbon shoes to do that because we're not trying to chase better running economy from the actual run itself. We're trying to get fit from the run to get better running economy. We use these lightweight attributes in carbon plates and soft, high compliant foams because they are associated for us using less oxygen when we need to, which is usually an all out effort or a hard effort or to feel good probably to run at a faster pace and feel like we're doing it easier. But the whole idea is to be comfortable within that purpose of the run. And sometimes going out and collecting a low intensity run, which I think most of the population do struggle with doing, they run at moderate high intensities. The shoe that's probably a little bit lighter probably is a bit more enjoyable for a shoe that you only use two or three days a week, which is what the activity guidelines suggest. But you know, as health practitioners, we we want everyone to run more often. <laughs> and, and so having a variation of shoe geometry and having a variation of shoe stack height, and having a variation of compliant foam or stable foam, there's a time and place for all of these relative to the individual's um, current state of either injury, soreness, or even experience in running at that point in time. So we're pretty lucky because the industry while it's overwhelming, once the knowledge is there, you've got a lot of tools to be able to keep your athlete from losing time to run or losing time to injury. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I reckon that sums up. We could talk like this for hours, mate. But I reckon, just, yeah, I reckon. Um, so people are going to have to list. They're going to get to listen to like some of the shoe companies now talk about sort of what's uh, what's coming out. This is definitely exciting stuff. I do think this this conflicting opinion. Some people think that there hasn't been much innovation in running, but I think. <laughs> The last decade has been phenomenal, uh, not just from performance and well, performance is the big one, I think, with performance footwear. But um, as I'm sure some of the companies will discuss about sustainability, mm -hmm. um, I guess what I also wanted to mention, what I think is probably good, is um, when it comes to the runners or yeah, patients coming in looking for shoes. Um, I think it's good to build that relationship with somewhere that they can go try the shoes on. So obviously they're, they're getting that that comfort filter in by trying a few different shoes on and then getting yeah. that experience. Uh, so run, running specialty stores, if there's some, some somewhere we can build a relationship, that's where they can go try the shoes on and have that, um, it, hopefully not just based on objective measures of how, how, how much the shoe everts, but have that discussion, yeah. like shoe for purpose. So say that going to the yeah. store, the, 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 the um, sales assistant will be like, what's your running experience what what Absolutely. sort of running do you want to do what are you training yep. for what's your how many years you've been running what shoes yes. have you liked in the past what's worked for you what hasn't worked for you it's like it's all that yep. that, that history Absolutely. and that's where i would because i like although i run in so many models i still i can't keep up with with all the different models that are coming out so you i when i write a shoe prescription in in clinic for someone i try to just give attributes footwear attributes so whether it's a, a stiffer stiffer midsole um or um higher stack lower stack high, yeah. high drop, low drop um medial stability um could be medial post could be just a uh, wider geometry for for stability in the frontal plane um Absolutely. you want to you want to send them to a store that they know about those characteristics um so if, if they don't you can you can have a chat and hopefully do some in-store education around as a podiatrist what what you look for what sort of shoe mm -hmm. features may help offload or help certain runners and their their, their chronic or recurring injuries especially yep um and, and look I'll yeah. Just to add on, add on to that, Tom, is that never underestimate the knowledge of some of these retailers and especially retail shops. Some of the best conversations and my learnings from running in the running industry is speaking to these guys who run 100 to 100 miles a week on the long run and finding out what's in the shop, what's new, what's coming out, and their intuition from their own running experience and their own customer service and seeing you know, 20, 30 people per day in fitting shoes sometimes exceeds our knowledge as podiatrists. Yep. If I would argue almost probably more so. So there's got to be a bit of respect for some people who work in these retails. Their knowledge can be quite high, even if they don't have a qualification as such, because unfortunately this is very muddy waters anyway. I'd argue that the experience, this is probably a bit more art than science at this point in time still. Yeah, definitely. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Beautiful. All right. Nice place to finish. 
Sorry we went over time. Sorry, other first running company. I'm not sure who it will be, but yeah. Doesn't matter if it